what we don't tend to have in the English language or in our mainstream medical system is an understanding that the energetics of our bodies is something tangible that is very integral to the overall health and well-being of our of ourselves of, of all of our various systems so when i do my work as a healer and somebody comes to me and they've got either physical pain or emotional pain or trauma in their in their story in their background my curiosity immediately goes to when when did it start and why did it start and what caused it because there is always a cause Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Shifting Dimensions podcast. I'm your host, Jumi Moses, and thank you so much for tuning in. I have the pleasure of speaking with today, Megan Edge. Megan has been helping people since 2007 via her counseling services with a focus on empower empowerment and deep healing of emotional, energetic, and physical trauma. She spent the last three decades studying the metaphysical fields of astral projection, dream work, tarot, chakras, angel therapy, and past lives, and so much more. She's also the author of The Heart's Journey, Healing Hearts, Oracle Cards, and Guidebook. Megan, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. Thank you so much, Jimmy. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm so looking forward to our conversation today. Yes, I'm excited to have you here as well, because I think you are filled with so much knowledge, and I'm excited to get into our conversation about all things healing trauma, forgiveness, and um, numerology as well. But I want to start off by asking you, you know, what's your family's religious background, and how did it influence your understanding of God and, and the world beyond? That's a beautiful question. It, my my religious upbringing, I would say, was unconventional. My family historically were Protestants, so I'm told. I was baptized when I was quite young. Uh, or no, actually, sorry, I wasn't baptized. <laughs> that caused a frisson in the family because my grandmother wanted me to be baptized. And my mother said that that wasn't something that she wanted to have happen to me. She wanted me to be able to make up my own mind when I became an adult about what path um, I wanted to take, what path I wanted to follow. So I wasn't brought up in a in a strict religious household or anything like that. In fact, I was given a lot of free reign and imagination to learn what the world has to offer, what different kinds of belief systems, faith systems have to offer. And, and what I ultimately came to at a very early age is that nature is my temple. The forest is where I am most connected to something greater than myself or the beach or the meadow. And I grew up in a foraging family. We spent an enormous amount of time out in nature, being very comfortable and very confident in that environment. And but then in addition to that, my mother was herself a fairly religious person in her own way. And so she brought that compassion, that understanding of the importance of community, a lot of the really beautiful Christian tenants um, were, were, sort of, were woven into the way in which I was brought up. But then equally, there were Buddhist tenants and there were, there were other religions, other ideas and ideologies that were discussed around the kitchen table. And so we were a deeply spiritual family, but we were also a very, or in addition to that, we were a very um, grounded in nature family. I think that's very interesting that, you know, you have the ability to kind of explore and come into your own spirituality. I think it's very telling, you know, that your grandmother wanted you to be baptized, right? Because that's just the thing you do when you're a Christian. And your mom was just kind of like, no, I kind of want her to choose that for herself as she gets older. Mm -hmm. And and that, and I find that very um interesting and beautiful that you had that opportunity and even a lot of Christians that I've talked to I mean I grew up Christian as well and I've seen many times where people are baptized when they're babies but then they get re-baptized as adults because they've kind of come into their own spirituality and understanding of God for themselves so they feel like mm -hmm. they need to get re-baptized because it truly now solidifies their relationship with with God um, but anyways I think that your story is very interesting because you got to explore different um, 
religious or spiritual beliefs and kind of weave all of them together. And I love that you're so connected to nature. I was mm. listening to something recently where someone was talking about how, you know, we have, you know, the different elements, we have water, air, fire, um, the earth. So mm -hmm. she had said that for everyone, it's different. And for some people, they're really called towards something, right? So you said that your family, what was the word foragers? Is that the right word? For, foragers, yeah. So yes. foraging is going out into nature yeah. and and collecting wild foods to mm -hmm. then bring back to the table as part of our of our meals. Right. And I want to ask just a little bit deeper. So in and you, that was part of like your family culture and tradition, but were there other things that made you feel more called to it? Or is it just sort of, you built that relationship with the forest, for example, just because of how you grew up? I would say the latter more than the former. Okay. It, it was a very, a very experiential experience being in the forest with my family and looking for mushrooms or looking for berries or being out on the lake and fishing or on the beach and collecting, you know, oysters and clams and things like that. And, the, and I mean, the funny thing is I assumed that that was a normal childhood and it wasn't until I became an adult. And especially when I started to just talk freely about things like foraging and, and eating wild mushrooms that I, I, I learned that actually that's not <laughs> a very typical childhood for yeah. most people. Um, and in fact, the, the very idea of nature being part of a spiritual experience is divorced from a lot of mainstream religion, I found. And, and when I was in university, one of the things that I studied was comparative religions. I've, I've always been fascinated by, by how a person's belief system shapes and forms their perspective and experience of the world around them. And so in order to understand another person's experience, it's helpful to know what their cultural heritage is, what that background is, because that, that belief system, it gets infused in our DNA. For me, the infusion of nature as my temple is, it feels like it's in my DNA. It feels as though this is something that's been passed down to me from the grandmothers and the grandmothers and the ancestors, this relationship that we have with the natural world and the things that are in it that can support us. And there's a, there's a revival of a sort of, of interest in, in this happening now. And it has been for a number of decades. Um, and for some people, it's never been forgotten. But for a lot of people, it's it's a, a aha moment when they recognize that they can be in charge of their own medicine through their belief system and their relationship with their world around them, however that shows up. And one of the things that always fascinated me about religion is the healing aspect of religion. And as much as it can be divisive and, and abusive, it can also be incredibly healing, regardless of what religious system you're in or what you believe or your relationship with God or a higher being or, you know, whatever. Within that belief system, there can be an incredible potential and capacity for healing. And so that's what's always fascinated me about religions and how we celebrate ourselves as human beings and our relationship with the divine and what a healing relationship that that can be. Fascinating. I really love the part where you said that, you know, you, it kind of feels like it's in your DNA, right? And I've been coming across a lot of topics centered around like the ancestors, right? And like, what's in your family lineage? How did your people commune with the divine? Because that could potentially be the way you should be communing with the divine that might be more attuned to you, right? And, you know, a lot of times we're indoctrinated into certain religious or spiritual practices and we're told to kind of just go with it. But I, I've heard mm -hmm. people say that not all spiritual and religious practices are um, the right path for everyone, right? Like we mm -hmm. all have a specific path towards the divine, or I should say, we all have a path that's more aligned with us, right? Because I'm sure, you know, we can adopt certain things from Christianity, um, Hinduism, Buddhism. I mean, you know, they all have like a, a running theme, right? But the mm -hmm. point is that there's certain practices, certain ways of praying or communing with the divine that are more aligned with you based on your ancestral lineage or you know your people or your culture so i think it's very fascinating that you're you're bringing that up and you're right i think it's becoming something that's coming to the 
you know, front of our consciousness, the collective consciousness where people are looking deeper into that. And that's actually something I, I want to focus on and dedicate a whole episode on, you know, just trying to figure out like, what's your ancestral lineage as it pertains to religious and spiritual practices. So thank you so mm -hmm. much for sharing that. And you also talked about healing. You, you, you briefly touched on that. And that's something that you do. I know that's a huge part of your work. So before we even get into that, right, there's something that you said that I read in your bio that I thought was very interesting, which is um, you talk about healing of emotional, energetic, and physical trauma, right? Mm -hmm. I think people kind of can guess what emotional trauma is. They can guess what physical trauma is. I was very intrigued by energetic trauma. What is that? So our whole system is an energetic system. We have a parasympathetic system. We have um, a chakra system. We have a lymphatic system. We have a nerve system. It's physical, but it's also electromagnetic. It's also energetic. When someone talks about having low energy, the person they're talking to understands what that means. But if you try to define that in terms of a physical experience, it becomes an interesting conversation into the relationship that we have between the way that we feel and how our bodies physically respond to those feelings. So if energetically someone's feeling low, we can associate that to they're probably feeling kind of heavy. Maybe they're feeling lethargic. They don't have a lot of mental acuity in that moment. They're feeling really dragged down. They're feeling really overwhelmed. We've got lots of words in the English language that we can use to describe what that feeling is. What we don't tend to have in the English language or in our mainstream medical system is an understanding that the energetics of our bodies is something tangible that is very integral to the overall health and well-being of, our, of ourselves, of, of all of our various systems. And our mainstream medicine is very good at at seeing symptoms at the physical level that are quantitative and finding ways to treat the symptoms. But what our mainstream medical system isn't proficient at is understanding the energetics of the pain that someone is feeling or the discomfort that someone is feeling or the disease that someone is ex exhibiting. There's, a, there's lots of questions that aren't generally asked in mainstream medicine or, or in North American medicine that are asked in other medical systems other than our own about how we are feeling. What is our energy? What is our energetic system doing? And how is our energetic system holding pain and trauma at the physical level? So when I do my work as a healer and somebody comes to me and they've got either physical pain or emotional pain or trauma in their in their story, in their background, my curiosity immediately goes to when. When did it start and why did it start and what caused it? Because there is always a cause. There is always a cause for the things that show up in our bodies. And if we can create a medical model that looks to that those questions, we ha will have the capacity to experience deep and permanent healing. And that deep and permanent healing is only going to occur if we make our healing a spiritual experience, a spiritual journey, and ask some of those bigger questions questions as to the why and the how of it because the symptoms are not as important as the reason why the symptoms are showing up mm, okay so I want to make sure I understand this correctly I, my my mind was racing as you were talking because I was trying to you know connect all the dots right so mm -hmm. it, it sounds like okay we have emotional and physical trauma but the energetic trauma that you're talking about is more spiritual right it's more on the metaphysical plane is it is it an individual thing or is energetic trauma more intertwined with others? So what do I mean by that? Like, so let's say someone um, smacks you, right? And on an emotional level, you feel sad that you've been hit. On a physical level, you feel feel the pain. What would mm -hmm. be the energetics of that? Would, you, would it just be the energy of the person having malicious intent towards you and you holding on to that? Or is the energy more of like, an amplified sadness that you feel on an emotional level? 
it's more direct than that. It's more immediate than that. Okay. It's shock. Uh, Think about electricity okay. and an electrical shock. When somebody comes into our energy field and abuses us in some way, whether we're expecting it or not, it creates a shock wave in our energy field. And that shock wave, it, it's it's like an like an earthquake or it's like a sonic boom that the 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 hit happens, the shock wave goes out. If a person isn't able in that moment or shortly after the event to heal that shock, it settles into the body. It settle, settles in and tries to find a way to get the person's attention so that it can be healed. So in in the in the model of healing that I work with what I've come to see and believe is that once pain shows up, discomfort shows up or disease shows up, at, at that moment that we become aware of that, we've already been in energetic pain from the moment of the event that is the cause of it to the moment of the awareness that our body is uncomfortable. And in that time, if we had the wherewithal or we had the support around us of somebody who recognizes the impact of that energetic shockwave to our system, the healing could be done before it shows up as a physical complaint in the body. And that's where that some of that religious healing can, can come from. And if you, if you look at some of the healing modalities in indigenous cultures, there is an immediate response from the community, or at least traditionally, there would be an immediate response from the community to a, a pain or an abuse or, um, or or an event that would be considered traumatic because they had a recognition of how important it is to heal that event before it settles into the physical body. It's just more challenging, but not impossible to heal something once it is enmeshed in with the physical body. Wow, I love how you described it initially where you said it it's kind of like a shock it's kind of like electricity kind of zapping you right and mm -hmm. and that is the imprint which again just to make sure the listeners understand and I and I is it safe to assume that emotional trauma and energetic trauma kind of like merge with one another yes okay so they're not yeah, are they are they are they super distinct or most of the time they're kind of enmeshed with each other I would say that they are enmeshed most okay. of the time because okay. I mean, the thing that we have to recognize again with this healing modality, this way of thinking about healing and about well-being is that this system that we call our bodies is not compartmentalized the way in which Western medicine is very good at compartmentalizing, right? And I, I don't say that to disparage Western medicine. I've had 17 surgeries in my life. I have been saved. My life has been saved with modern medicine. It's also been made an awful lot worse with modern medicine on, on the pharmaceutical side of things, which is a lot of people's experiences. Uh, but what that is to say is that when we recognize that this system is a whole system, it's constantly interacting, it's not chopped up into layers, then we can understand that there is no distinction. I mean, for the, for the, the ease of the conversation, we can talk about emotional healing, physical healing, energetic healing, spiritual healing, but all of those things have to happen at the same time or in conjunction with one another, or else you're not going to have the healing, right? So the, the way that I like to describe it is this, if you've got back problems and you go to the chiropractor only, but you don't also go to the massage therapist, you are not going to heal those back problems because the muscles are gonna pull back to where they were before if they're not healed. And then ultimately at the end of the day, you're not gonna be able to heal that back pain permanently until you look at why the back pain has shown up in the first place. Right, looking at the root cause. If not, it's kind That's of like right. whack-a-mole, right? Where you like <laughs> whack one mole, it pops up on the other side. Um, okay, so something you talk about and and I think something you teach on as well is, is white light healing and you mm -hmm. discovered that you had this gift when you were younger I believe where you had a lot of you know small illnesses here and there a lot of cold and you know you were always having cold or flu and I think you you said that 
when you would like play with other young kids and stuff sometimes who were sick you'd kind of like put your hands on them and kind of notice that there was like some sort of energy transference and you know helped that helped them heal so what exactly is white light healing and how did you know that that's what you were doing well, to be honest, I didn't know that's that's what I was doing until I became an adult and I was looking after children. And when a child would, let's say they slipped and fell and they bumped their knee, um, they would come running to me instead of their their parent. This was in a, in a group that I was running of kids. I was taking kids and their parents out into nature and, and teaching them all about nature and and all of its wonder wonderfulness. Uh, so I already had a relationship with these children. It's not like like they chose me over their their parent, but they were drawn to me because when they would come to me, I would put a hand my hand on their back. I would put my hand on their on their front, just just gently, like intuitively, I would do this, and then I would just talk to them about what they were feeling. I would acknowledge that they were experiencing pain, and then I would ask them um, how they would like the pain to be removed from their bodies. And, and most of the time, especially the really young ones, they would just take my hand and put it where the bruise or the bump was that they knew they understood. Um, when I was younger, when I was a child, I was always the one rooting for the underdog. If there was someone on the playground that was getting bullied, I would go over and, you know, stand in front of the bully and I would defend them. And then I would look after them afterwards. And so what I was doing as a child was intuitively the same thing that I was doing as an adult with children when I was when I was working with them. The reason I called it white light healing is because that's how I described it to the to the kids. I would say, okay, so you put my hand on your knee. So now I want you to imagine that there's this beautiful white light coming off of my hands. Maybe it's like snow, it's sparkly, or it's clear, but it just has that that energy of um, cotton, you know, or a, a blanket being wrapped around you. And, and so they would, they would participate in this healing moment. It wasn't me doing it for them or to them. It was them intuitively seeking the healing for themselves. And I happened to be the conduit for that energy. And because kids are so in tune with color, um, calling it white light and thinking of it like snow or that, which is cooling and which is sparkly, it, it was just something that they could understand really easily. And so it became... I've started calling it white light healing. It's laying on of hands. There's lots of different ways that you can, you know, describe it. It's it's Reiki. It's it's all it's it's connection between two people or more than, you know, one or two or three or four people working together to move energy so that that shock wave doesn't stay in the body. It's it's a way of moving energy. So where does the energy go? Right. Because, you know, there's this thing mm. that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Right. So right. as the conduit of, of this energy and you're you are working with the person who's seeking healing to, you know, heal them. Where does the energy go? Right. How do you make sure that energy isn't transferred onto you as the conduit? Which is an excellent, excellent question. And it was a technique that I had to learn. I, I learned I learned it through studying various sort of healing masters, but I also tuned into my own intuition and to ask that very question. Energy, what I've come to learn, what I come to, I've come to believe is that energy in itself is inert. Right? It's neither good nor bad. It just is, just exists. And it's everywhere. It's all around us. It's just in in the atmosphere. It's part of, of why we live here and how we live here. It's just that, that energy is there. If we can't necessarily feel it or taste it. It's kind of like the wind. We can see the result of it. We can feel it on our skin, but we don't, we can't see it. Right. So it's the same kind of idea. When I'm teaching students about how, how to not hold on to other people's energy, the first thing that we talk about is how you really cannot hold on to energy. It's just going to slip through your fingers and it will be, um, neutralized once it leaves the physical form so the physical form holds on to energy and either well it creates a relationship with that energy so maybe it's a negative energy or negative relationship with the energy or maybe it's a positive relationship with the energy when the energy is in the human body it it has feeling we can feel it 
but once it's no longer needed by the, the individual anymore, it's no longer needed to support something or keep something down or whatever its, its purpose is, when it is given permission to leave the body or it is released from the body, it just goes back into the ether. It's almost like it joins the neutral energy that's, that's all around us. It only has substance when we give it substance. Does that make sense? Perfect sense, actually. So yeah. just to make sure I recap what you're saying. And, and I have the same intuitive feeling and understanding that energy is neutral, right? It's, I don't want to say it's a tool, but more or less it's, it, it's kind of based on who wields that energy and the interpretation you give the energy, right? So mm -hmm. to, to that point, so when th that an energy is released from someone, right? If it's a negative energy, I like you're like that energy is no longer attached to the person who had a negative connotation or a negative understanding of that energy. So once mm -hmm. it's been released, it's kind of back into its neutral state, right? So if for some reason it didn't pop back into ether, hypothetically, and mm -hmm. someone else picked up that energy, they could also transmute it to be something positive for them or they can mm -hmm. keep it as negative if they wanted to. But more or less, you're saying that most of the time that energy is neutralized and kind of returns back to the ether. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think too, it gets diluted. I'm just thinking this, this just popped into my head as an analogy. Okay. You've got a glass of water. So you've, you've the water pours out of the sink, out of the, the tap, and, and you've got your glass of water. And you leave your glass of water on your desk and you forget about it. And the next day you think, oh, I don't think I want to drink that water anymore. Maybe it's gone flat or whatever. It's warm now. So you pour it back down the sink and the water returns to the water system. Mm. It's the same with energy. The energy returns to the energy system. But what can happen, and this is what I had to unlearn for myself and then was able to teach others how to do this, is to recognize if you're working with someone, especially someone who has deep trauma, and you find yourself exhausted or distracted or hyper-focused on your client's story that they shared with you, then something has been triggered in you from their experience that has not been resolved for you. And that's a clue that you need to do some self-care and you need to do some work personally to make sure that when you go back to that client, you're not bringing it back to them with your own unresolved trauma which is why when i when i teach my my healers program a big portion of that program is doing our own work with all the exercises and all the trainings that they're then going to be able to share with their clients but they have to do that work first right That's so people have said to me point. so many i've had this question so many times aren't you exhausted don't you get so tired at the end of you know a big class or a program or a talk or working with a client i don't I don't anymore, anymore. I used to, but I learned that I didn't need to, right? What I learned is that my client's story and their experiences are not mine unless I make them mine. Yeah, right? because I, I, I can imagine as a healer, it's very important to not get enmeshed with someone else um, because I, I think in order to be a healer, you also probably have an incredible amount of empathy as well, right? And also to your point too, like you said, we're all human beings, right? So we all have shared experiences. There mm -hmm. are certain traumas that a lot of us can relate to, right? And as a healer, you might come across someone who could still trigger things that need to be healed within you. Um, mm -hmm. And then you guys are both now like enmeshed with one another. So would, so is, will an energetic would an energetic protection also help in this scenario, right? Because I, I hear a lot of spiritual practitioners talk about like protecting your energy or asking for protection before engaging in any sort of healing modality or maybe tapping into other realms, right? In this particular conversation where we're talking about healing energetics, you're not necessarily tapping into a different realm. At least I don't know if you are, maybe you are, but do you ask for some sort of protection as well before you do this work? No. Okay. I don't. Uh, and the reason I don't, Jumi, is because 
when a person is asking for protection, I think it's really important that they understand where that request is coming from. And ultimately, it's coming from a place, I, I believe, others may disagree, and that's completely fine. But from my experience, it's coming from a place of fear. There's some, there's a fear factor there. If, if I don't put up my, my barriers, or if I don't, you know, if I don't, I don't know, chant or do my incense or whatever it is that, that the person does, if I don't do that, harm can come to me. But what I want to get really clear on is, is that you can have your incense and you can do your chant and you can carry your crystals around if you understand that the reason you're doing that is because it is in your highest good to keep your energy in a, in a high vibration in a place of well-being. Right? That it's not that you're not protecting yourself from somebody else. You're taking care of your energy systems, your energy fields. If you're, it's just like your immune system or your lymphatic system. If you're, if you're emphatic, your lymphatic system is strong and your body is taking care of its, of itself and it's flushing out toxins as you get exposed to them, because we do all day, every day in this world, emotional as well as physical. If your body is in a good, strong, healthy place, it doesn't need protecting because it is already strong enough to 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 manage all the things that come at it right now now having said that there is an exercise that i do with my daughters especially and um, we've been doing it forever which is that when we go downtown and there's a lot of negativity people are holding on to a lot of negative energy or into a mall and there's just a lot of energy whether it's negative or positive whatever um, we have a little thing where we say, we say shields up. And in that moment, what we're doing is we're visualizing this beautiful egg shaped um, shield around ourselves where the shield is, is mirrored on the outside so that anything that anyone tries to send towards us gets reflected back to them because it's theirs to deal with. It's not ours. And equally, it's mirrored on the inside so that anything we try to give to somebody else comes back to us and we're it's not coming from a place of fear it's coming from a place of honoring the space around us right honoring this distance between my heart and where my heart's energy is going to start interacting with the outside world and other people's energy fields so it's a it's about keeping it strong as opposed to protecting it from something some imagined or some believed or even some real stuff that might be coming at us it's a nuance <laughs> yes yes for sure there's definitely nuance there because I have had someone on the show um one of the first few episodes that I did where I kind of asked her the same similar question about protection and she kind of said that well when you ask for protection quote unquote it's most of the time it's coming from aligning yourself with the fear frequency and when you align yourself with the fear frequency and you ask for protection, if anything, you're kind of attracting more of what you don't want. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also heard others say like, you know, protecting your energy or asking for protection is important, especially for people who astro project, right? And kind of like find themselves traveling into these like different dimensions and when, or if they're talking to deceased people who've passed away, like mediums and stuff like that, right? So I've, I've heard both sides of it. I'm still kind of trying to sit on it for myself but I do know personally that I am very sensitive to energy and I, I've realized that over the last couple of years I, I knew I was sensitive to energy in terms of people's energy especially people that I'm close to but I over the last year year and a half I've become more sensitive to energy in a way where when I travel to a new place I pick up the energy like I can feel the collective energy of mm -hmm. the environment now I don't know if that's the true energy of the space or if that's just how as an individual I'm relating to the energy of the space it could be a couple of different things but mm -hmm. I'm always like cognizant of like oh I kind of feel um there's like a sinister energy in the air or I feel kind of like depressed and sullen right something like that I'll I, I might pick up and I know it's not for me it's from 
whatever is in the atmosphere, right? So mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. that sense, like what you're talking about with like the shields up, right? It's not from a place of fear because I don't think I'm in, I don't feel any sort of danger um, or fear picking up that energy, but it's sometimes if it's heavy energy where it's like sad energy, I'm like, I don't really want to feel this way. I want to feel lighter. So I guess, quote unquote, doing the shields up could be like a form of protection from that energy. But like you said, not from a place of fear, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I'm still kind of sitting on on the need for protection versus not needing it but it makes sense what you said and and it's I mean it's very personal and I'm not in any way um you know suggesting if if people are taking care of themselves in a way that when they do something that that is protective they feel better they feel good they feel like they've taken care of themselves that's that's great I think that's a really good thing to be aware of and especially when you're well, think of it this way. If you're walking down the street and it's nighttime and you pass a dark alley, are you going to walk down the dark alley or are you going to keep yourself safe by making the choice to keep walking into some place where there are people and where it's light? Like our bodies have an internal system that warns us when there is danger because there is danger in the world. Absolutely. There is danger in the world. And I think it would be foolish to just sort of traipse through the world with a naive idea that everybody loves you and no one's going to ever harm you. That's just not the case, unfortunately. It would be lovely if it were. Um, so it's I think what it becomes is a it becomes a practice. You know, you you decide for yourself where that line is between practically taking care of yourself so that you're safe physically and emotionally, and then allowing that trust to come in that you are safe and then being smart about it (laughs) absolutely yes you're 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 spot on with that so something you say that i want to touch on you 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 talk about the body as a spiritual journey right Mm -hmm. and i think we've kind of alluded to it talking about energetic healing and all of that stuff but what do you mean by the body being a spiritual journey what does that mean So for me, what it means is that I want to have a relationship with my body, a soul relationship with the physical body that allows me to live my best life, thrive as well as I know how to, and be of service to others. And so instead of looking at my body as just a physical thing, like a car that needs servicing every 600 miles or whatever it is, um, I I want to have a deeper relationship with my body. I want to be able to communicate with my body to understand what it needs as a separate entity from the soul that I believe resides in my body, but also in a symbiotic relationship. So what I've come to believe is that when things happen to us or when things happen to me, I'll be really personal with it. Something physical happens to me, like I stub my toe. I want to know why I stubbed my toe. I want to take a moment to sit down with my body and say to my toe, okay, first of all, do you need some attention? Like maybe you just need a pedicure. I don't know. Maybe you just need a massage. Or is there something deeper going on? Is there something a little maybe more spiritual in in terms of when we think of more spiritual, but perhaps I'm not following my path and my body's trying to get me to reorient the direction that I'm heading in. And because I'm obtuse and I'm stubborn and I'm not listening to the inner guidance that's happening, that first level of intuition, the body's gonna start to become a part of that experience, a part of that journey. But in addition to that, like another layer of that, I believe that we choose before we come into each lifetime, and this is, assuming that we come into more than one lifetime too. Uh, But I do believe that we design ourselves. So we make choices about our skin color, about the culture we're going to come from, about who our parents are going to be, about whether we're going to be male or female, whether we're going to be strong or we're going to have weaknesses or, you know, all these things, our eye color, our our hair. And we make these decisions in conjunction Junction with our soul and, and our soul's needs, why we're evolving, what we're evolving as we come into each lifetime, what we haven't yet learned that we can only uniquely learn through the body that we choose as we design it and we come into each lifetime. So that you cannot, I don't, 
I believe you cannot go through your lifetime and not be in right relationship with your body. And this idea that some cultures do have uh, that we, in order to achieve nirvana or to achieve the highest level to ascend, we have to leave, leave the physical body behind. And I understand where that's coming from, but I want to upset the apple cart a little bit and suggest the possibility that the reason we come here into these physical forms is because it's specifically what we can learn in the spiritual journey from the body that we choose each time that we come in here. And that that relationship is, is vital, that, that the ultimate temple is the body. It's your body is your ultimate temple. Yes. I, a hundred percent agree with everything that you're saying. I think um, the body is so honest, mm -hmm. especially when we're not being honest with ourselves. And I think <laughs> the body is really the catalyst a lot of times for our spiritual journey, right? Because mm -hmm. whether we look at energetic pain and trauma or emotional pain and trauma, all of that stuff settles in the body, right? It settles in the heart. It might settle in the lungs, in the legs, you know, aches and pains. And when you have recurring ailments or recurring physical pain in the body, at some point you have to check it out. You have to figure out, like you said, at the very beginning of what we were talking mm -hmm. about of the show, that when you have recurring physical pain, you have to figure out like, where is this coming from? It's one thing to go to a chiropractor if you're having back pain, but you need to kind of dig deeper into why do you keep having recurring back pain, right? And it might not just be because you're sitting in the wrong chair, right? Sometimes it could be as simple as that, but it's rarely as simple as that, right? <laughs> so I think the body is such an a powerful intuitive force because before we can even understand our emotions, our feelings, the body kind of tells us what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. So I agree. I think the body serves a, a pivotal role, not just in our experience as human beings, based on our culture, skin color, where we're born, how we're raised, what we're shaped like, but also just from a point of like, feeling how our emotions kind of move through our body and where they settle. So I agree with everything that you said. And I do think that our bodies are a part of nature, right? Mm -hmm. So something you talk about, which I was so intrigued by, because I'm like, I've never heard of this before, is the nature numerology nexus for self-love and healing. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's break this into two parts, right? So okay. <laughs> let's level set for the audience. What is the nature numerology nexus? What does that term mean? So what we're looking at is that nature is full of patterns. Um, for anybody who know, understands numerology, has studied numerology, certain numbers are assigned meaning or numbers are assigned meaning based on where they are in the sequence of numbers. Um, and then there are combinations as well. And the different energies and different frequencies of each of those numbers. When we look at nature, nature is full of numerical patterns. It's full of patterns. Um, the golden circle, the Fibonacci series, just all you have to do is look at a pomegranate or a stem of broccoli. And you can see just how absolutely, not only beautiful, like mind-bogglingly beautiful these things are, but you can also see the patterns because if you hold up a little stub of broccoli, it looks exactly like a tree. It looks like a deciduous tree. It branches the same way, right? So the, it's there's a, there's a lot to it, and it's probably a whole episode. <laughs> um, but suffice it to say that it that looking at nature, looking at numerology, looking at the way that the two can mesh together gives you an an opportunity to see more than you would normally see and why is that important because everything around us i believe is trying to communicate with us in some way or another or or we are giving significance to the things that we see around us so let's say you see a crow once and you go oh it's a crow and then a few minutes later you see another crow you're like oh Oh, there's two crows. That's interesting. <laughs> then there's three crows. 
And what I always say is once you get to three, start paying attention. <laughs> Things come in three for a reason. And by the third time, something or someone is trying to get your attention. Could be your higher self, you know, could be somebody else. Who knows? Could be the universe. But it's it's that looking at those patterns and understanding the significance of them for yourself personally. And then bringing in that that combination between the na nature and what we think of nature and and the way in which we live in our environment and then the way in which nature can speak to us through these patterns through the mathematics of the environment and the way in which nature shows up for us i had an aha moment as you were talking okay so i'm going to hopefully i don't butch butcher this but i see a lot of repeating number sequences a lot you know over the last i would say 4 to 5 years that's been a big thing for me especially when i'm you know, trying to manifest something or I'm, I'm trying to figure something out, I get numbers that kind of speak to what I'm thinking about, right? Because sometimes numerology can be very personal. I know that repeating numbers tend to have an overarching definition, but you have to kind of look at it in, and interpret it with your intuition when you keep seeing it. But with that being mm -hmm. said, I would say that, you know, in beginning of 2018, up until this point, really. But at the beginning of 2018 to about 2020, I was starting to have this feeling, right? There was a lot of like physical issues I was like dealing with, some little minor illnesses here and there that were just current, like recurring and a lot of like, you know, heartache. So I started to have this like overwhelming feeling of like, am I living life for myself? I, I didn't really feel like I had the confidence that I needed to have. Um, that was essentially like the beginning of like the self-love journey mm -hmm. and healing that I desperately needed. And I didn't realize that I needed, but that was around the same time I would see the number 1111 all the time. Right. And I know that's a very popular number, but I didn't see it all the time, but I just, it was like every single time I looked at my clock, 1111, 1111, and I would be seeing five, 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 five. Right. And then on top of that, to bring in the nature piece, I would see butterflies all the time. Mm. I'd be seeing butterflies all the time. So I look back on that moment and my interpretation of it is that like, although I was seeing butterflies, what I was intuitively getting was that like, I was going to be entering a period where I would kind of be in a cocoon, right. Where like mm. I needed to kind of go into like a, a darker space to heal, to shed so that mm -hmm. I can re-emerge as this butterfly and be aligned with my soul path, right? Because I think 1111 kind of, that's the that's the resonance of that number. And 555 mm -hmm. resonates a lot with change, right? So it's I kind see. of like aligning with soul purpose and doing things that are more aligned with you mm -hmm. and then embracing change because your life is about to change. You're going on this, this journey. So as you were speaking, I was like, oh my God, it's that nature numerology nexus mm -hmm. that you talked about that serves um that's that could be of service to a self-love and healing and that's literally like what I experienced that was like kind of like a guiding path and force for me wow that's wonderful I love when I have these moments because I'm like yeah. I just that was that was incredible <laughs> what a different way to look at it for me my my symbol of transformation was or still is but at the time it was seeing hearts everywhere and I was already doing a lot of spiritual stuff. I mean, I've always been on some kind of a spiritual path, but I've I've stepped off the path on occasions, like when I had my babies and married and kid, you know, all that sort of stuff, household things. And I was always in chronic pain, and I was I was constantly ill, constantly ill, and exhausted, and I couldn't understand why, because I thought I was living my best life. I thought that I had a good man in my life, and I. Th thought that I was following my path in my life and that that process of transformation that understanding that oh maybe I have actually stepped too far off the path and I need to find my way back how am I going to do that what what symbol or what sign or what synchronicity is going to give me the the direction that I I clearly need because the universe is really coming in now like that third level of intuition the universe is saying look girl We've given you so much, so many opportunities and so much information, and you're just not getting it. So 
it's going to be big. <laughs> we got to get your attention. <laughs> but part of that, the, the gentle part of that process was that I started to see hearts in nature. I, I kept finding, I started finding heart stones. I started seeing clouds shaped like hearts. I was seeing hearts in the burls of trees. I was, I was just seeing them absolutely everywhere. And the question that I had put to the universe was, please show me a sign that when I see it, I will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am following my heart above all other voices. And then the universe has a really great sense of humor and said, okay, <laughs> here you go. We're going to give you all these hearts. And that, that was what put me on the trajectory for claiming what I now recognize as my birthright as a healer. And in order to claim that birthright as a healer, I had to heal me to the, to the best of my ability first. And then invite my my clients who are like my co-collaborators on the healing journey to come into my life so that we could then, then do those journeys together, those healing journeys together. Beautiful. I love I love what you said that um the universe has a sense of humor because it definitely <laughs> does. I, I love the I love that the ask was let me know without a shadow of doubt, doubt that I'm on the right path. I'm following my heart. And you started to see hearts in nature. That's beautiful. Yep. <laughs> um, so I think one of the biggest things when it comes to healing, which I, you know, touch on a few times on the podcast, because I just think it's very important. I think it's, it's a huge ingredient and cannot be bypassed when it comes to healing. And that is the role of forgiveness in mm. energetic, I believe energetic, spiritual and physical healing. But mm -hmm. I want to hear from you, right, as a practicing mm -hmm. healer, what are your thoughts about the role of forgiveness um, as part of the, the healing journey? So again, I'm going to upset the apple cart a little bit and go unconventional on this one. I feel that too much emphasis is put on people to forgive when they are not ready to understand what even happened, never mind understand the concept of forgiveness. So when I work with my clients and I often will have clients come to me and say, I just can't forgive him. It's like, then don't. Just don't focus on that right now. Let's do some other healing first. Let's, let's, let's dig underneath what you're presenting to find out if forgiveness is even necessary as a concept, right? Like what I, what I want people to be thinking about is that what are, or I'll put it to this way. What I have seen people do is get themselves completely bound into guilt because they've been told that in order to move forward on their healing, they have to forgive, but they're not ready. They don't want to, or quite frankly, it's not forgivable in this realm. Some things are not forgivable in this realm. So I've done a lot of work with people who have experienced childhood sexual abuse. It's one of my areas of expertise. I used to work on a crisis line when I was in university. I was did was doing my social work, um, did my crisis line training. And I just, and I know from friends, family, clients, the stories of what can happen to little tiny children, unforgivable in my books. Can we understand the dynamic that created that circumstance for the adult who is ultimately responsible for that behavior? Yes, we can do that work. But at no point should a five-year-old, even when they're 95, have to feel like they haven't fully healed their trauma because they haven't forgiven their perpetrator. The perpetrator will find his forgiveness somewhere else. It will not be from that five-year-old person, right? The perpetrator can go to God. He can go to his God and say, am I forgiven? Because I understand, I've done my work and I understand why I was so awful to that little person. I've healed myself. Can I be forgiven? But he has no right to ask for forgiveness from that little girl or that little boy. That's my, my feeling about it. So I feel like I think that we give a lot of lip service to the idea of forgiveness as a touchstone or a cornerstone for healing, that you cannot experience full healing until you've done this thing 
this forgiveness thing, I don't think that's fair to the person who's doing their healing work because they're already taking an enormous amount of, like it takes an enormous amount of courage and vulnerability to do your healing work, right? They're already doing that. To put that burden on top of them, on top of the work that they're already doing, I feel is counterproductive. So I've often given my clients permission to just put that down, put the forgiveness piece down. Maybe you'll pick it up later. Maybe you won't need to, right? Because ultimately, the person who has committed the act of abuse is the person who should be seeking forgiveness from themselves or of themselves, not from anybody else. And in my view, that's when that person takes responsibility for what they have done and why they did it. At that point, they can ask forgiveness from their God. Mm. Wow, this is incredible. Um my my wheels are spinning not because i necessarily have something to counter that i they're spinning because i'm actually sitting with it and i'm thinking about it because i think so what i've heard and also kind of like what i've ex experienced on a personal level too it's like i'm not really able to fully energetically move on from something until i release it and the best way to release it for me is to First, I gain an understanding of like what created that situation. And then once I understand it, it becomes non-personal. But mm -hmm. to your point too, there are things that I think about in this world and experiences that I'm like, but some things are just, they just seem and feel extremely unforgivable. And also forgiveness is subjective. Like what I might consider not a big deal to forgive. It could be very traumatic for someone else. And, you know, and it's something that they struggle to forgive so and then I think about too I, I hate to ramble here but I'm trying to like collect all my thoughts people talk about this whole idea of karma right where mm -hmm. you know part of what we're doing here on earth is learning lessons releasing things and sometimes karma is not like oh you do something bad to someone and like that bad thing is going, going to happen to you it's more mm -hmm. about how you're experiencing life right so if you find yourself in situations where you are struggling to learn a lesson, whether that's forgiveness, whether that's understanding, you might reincarnate in a similar situation and continue to learn that, right? So mm -hmm. that's kind of like where some people have argued why forgiveness is such a powerful tool because it's like an energetic detachment or cutting of that cord, cutting of that karmic contract. So I said a lot of that Right. I, I said a lot of things there. Right. I don't I don't really know how you're going to respond to that. But I hear what you're saying, that there's some things that are unforgivable. But like, how can somebody truly move forward energetically without releasing and not being attached to what happened to them? So when I say that there are some things that are unforgivable, I also said in this realm, mm. right? in this realm where we reside in our human bodies, having these human experiences part of that experience might be for the soul to have an event happen in their lives that is unforgivable at this in this level in this realm the soul realm is something completely different so when i've had clients who have been really struggling with this but they feel very deeply they might have a deep religious conviction that forgiveness is the final piece of their healing but they are just not ready they're not there or they don't want to it doesn't feel right then i say to them then forgive their higher self forgive the other person's soul give it to their higher self when you get over to the other side if it has still not been resolved you can figure it out over there or you take it into another lifetime perhaps where where the environment is is different and better for that particular piece of your journey to be completed. I, other cultures have different ways of working with this idea of forgiveness. And so I want to bring up the Ho'oponopono Ono, which is a Hawaiian, um, it's, I, I don't want to do it disservice, but it, it comes from Hawaii and it's a way to work with that piece of forgiveness. And, and what, the words for the Ho'oponopono Ono are, 
I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. You can say those words over and over and over again with that person in mind and just see what happens. Because it occurs to me that when, a, when you are ready, when you feel that you are ready to say about the event that you're, that you're not forgiving yet or the person that you're not forgiving yet, it shouldn't be a lot of work. That's how you know you're there is when it's, it's easy, right? It's easy. It, it can be easy. And when it's easy, it's, it basically lost its charge. It's like that energy that we were talking about earlier in the conversation. It's neutralized. You think of the person, you think of the event, they think of what they did to you, but you don't get a charge from it anymore. It doesn't give you anything anymore. You know, and maybe what it gave you at the time was that you needed to go really deep to find that anger about what had happened to you. And you needed to find a safe place in which you could express that anger. That's part of the healing journey. And once that is dissipated, it's so much easier, it can be easier to see the individual as their own wounded soul or their own wounded person and say the words of the Hapono Ono to just say, thank you. Thank you for bringing that event into my life. Thank you for bringing that experience into my life. I love you. I mean, I don't necessarily love you, but I love you. <laughs> you know, I love the journey. I love the experience. You can get there. I just don't feel that it, it needs to be the cornerstone of someone's healing. Mm -hmm. Like the, that, that they can't heal without it. Right. You yeah. said something powerful there um, that in the grand scheme of things, when you arrive at forgiveness, it should feel easy. And I agree with that. I think you arrive at forgiveness. I don't think you can force your way into it. I don't think it's like, mm -hmm. well, I'm supposed to forgive. So let me snap my fingers and force myself to forgive. No, I actually think that you arrive at forgiveness, but mm -hmm. you can, you could potentially arrive at what forgiveness is supposed to look like for you. I will say that based mm -hmm. on your intentional work, right? So like you said, sometimes there's still so much anger about the situation that needs to be expressed. I don't think you can forgive by bypassing that anger, by bypassing that frustration, right? Like all the heavy, icky stuff has to come up to the surface. And if you get to the point where you're able to analyze it and you feel detached from it, then forgiveness you know, ensues, right? Like, it, I think you have to arrive at forgiveness. So I agree with that. And I think it's very interesting how you broke that down. And it's giving me a lot to, to think about, you know, because forgiveness isn't easy when you tell people you need to forgive, but it can mm -hmm. be if you arrive at that as part of your self healing journey. But maybe there is a world where you arrive at self healing or healing in general, without needing to forgive. I never thought about that as a possibility. So you've given that you give, you've put that thought in my mind now. So I'm going to sit with that a little bit more. Okay. Um, do you think that there are ripple effects to non-forgiveness? I think there's ripple effects to everything. Mm -hmm. I think the, the way that I like to envision a, an individual is that the individual is standing in the center of a pond. We're not ahead or behind. We're in the middle. We're in the center. Anything that I do in the center of my pond, any pebble I drop ripples out and when it gets to the edges of my pond which is my energy field when it gets to the edges of my energy field if it still has energy and if it is for someone else's highest good to be impacted by that energy that ripple then that ripple will meet their pond edge and move into their pond into their energy field so can you see the visualization like you just imagine you're standing in the middle of a pond and you you move your hands and the waves move out and those waves will continue to move out until they reach something that stops them and then they'll come back or they will continue at infinitum into somebody else's energy field if that person needs to have what you're putting out whether that's joy or sadness or anger or fear or trauma or love it all ripples out the thing about non-forgiveness 
for not forgiving somebody is first of all, you have to believe that it's important that you forgive them for it to have an, an effect. And then you, then I would suggest that you look at why is that important to you? Why does it matter to you that you're able to forgive them or they're able to forgive you your trespasses, you know, whatever that might be. Um, the other piece of it, well, so I'll share a story. When my girl's father and I were separating, and that's part of why those hearts came into my life, because I was looking to do this in the most, with the most integrity that I could. He said to me at one point in, in great anger, he said, I just hope one day I can forgive you. And I said to him, I don't need you to forgive me, but if it matters to you that one day you can forgive me, then I hope, hope you get there, right? His non-forgiveness is something that he's holding on to. And the only person that it's impacting negatively is him. If I'm not going to participate in that interaction, if I'm going to come from a place where I believe that there is actually, there are no mistakes, everything happens with purpose, everything happens for a reason, even if in the moment we don't like the reason or we don't see what the reason is, then I, I, we actually get to a place where there is no need for forgiveness because there is nothing that needs to be forgiven. But I will say this, that is not where I would start with a client who comes to me and is looking to heal and resolve trauma. That's not where we start. That's where we eventually get to, right? Because what we need to start is in the acknowledgement of what has happened and the story that the person is holding on to about why that happened or how it happened. That's where we start the healing journey. And if eventually we get to a place where the client says, I see now that there was a reason and a purpose for this to happen in my life. And now I can, I can integrate it into my life and maybe I can even use it to be of service to others. We will get there, but it's not where we start. Mm. We start with the story. I love what you, there are two things that I love that you said. I'm going to start with the last one because what I heard, right. It's kind of like if a client comes to you, they're dealing with so much trauma. You're basically kind of doing an autopsy of the trauma <laughs> and, and where it is in the body. And you're like pulling back the later layers, you're dissecting the trauma, you're dissecting the stories connected to that trauma. And if your client happens to arrive at forgiveness, and that's where they arrive, right? But you're mm -hmm. not starting off with, oh, this is your trauma. Well, this is, you have to forgive the perpetrator and like, let's so that you can move forward. It's like, no, let's pull back all of these layers. And you might even get to a point where, which is ties into the second thing that you, that you said that I loved, where you might not even need forgiveness because there's nothing to forgive. But like you said, it, I think that's like, <laughs> obviously you've been doing this work for over 30 years, right? So you are in terms of, your your consciousness and where you are in your spiritual journey there's been a lot of work there right so I think mm -hmm. someone would have to be very deep in that work constantly to arrive there but I will say that sometimes I I feel the same way too where I look at certain things in my life where, where I'm like I don't know if I've forgiven this but I don't feel like there's anything to forgive I'm not taking this on personally I'm not attached to this in any way I don't need to release it because it was never attached if that makes any sense so mm -hmm. there's so many layers there I hope the listeners listening can follow along but um yeah I'm just very intrigued by how you're you're breaking down this concept of forgiveness and I, I'm gonna sit with it more um so like this is the last final official question before we kind of start winding down the show but <laughs> does what's the role of intuition in healing I always love talking about intuition and I know mm. that you said that they're the three levels of intuitive wisdom. So what are those three levels and how do they help us heal and move through life? So first of all, yes, intuition is an incredibly important part of healing. I, I honestly don't believe you can have any kind of deeper permanent healing if you are not connected in some way to your intuition and willing to listen to your own wisdom, which is your first level of intuitive wisdom. You are the first level of intuitive wisdom. I would say that 99.9% .9 of the people on this planet do not understand how incredibly wise they already are within themselves. I firmly believe that every situation, circumstance, 
or event that happens in your life that is challenging or traumatic or difficult already has a solution that you have created and put in place before you ever got here. And what intuition is, is our efforts to access that information. So your immediate environment, your body, your brain, your memories, this lifetime and others, everything you'll ever need to know is already there. But do you trust it? Right? So fear and trust are the challenges of the first level of intuition. First, understand what you're afraid of. And then do your work around your relationship with trust. And that, that's a big ask. That's a big ask. Because many of us grow up not trusting and we don't even know that we're not trusting. And again, I don't mean like trusting that you can walk down a dark alley. I mean, trusting that there's a reason and a meaning for the things that happen in your, in your life. Trusting yourself to know that wisdom already. And as we talked about, our bodies give us the answer. You know, our, our bodies are like a pendulum. A pendulum moves back and forth. We, when we use pendulums in, in metaphysical work or intuitive work, we're using the, the way the pendulum moves to indicate an answer, or yes or a no. But your body is already a pendulum. You will move towards that which is for your highest good, and you will move away from that which is not for your highest good. Right? So instead of asking a thousand people on Facebook what you should do, start with what you know you need to do because you know it it's there you might have to break it down you might need someone to hold your hand while you figure it out but you already know it you already have all the answers but here's the beautiful thing we have free will and part of what free will gives us is the ability to say no thank you to whatever it is that's being offered to us including our own wisdom and our own knowledge right so what i've seen happen and what i've experienced is that if we're not willing to listen to our own wisdom and take action based on that wisdom, and there's something really important that we need to be paying attention to or we need to be doing in our lives or changing in our lives, then external forces will start to show up. They'll start to participate. And you can call them whatever you want to call them. You can call them guides. You can call them angels, deceased loved ones. doesn't matter. There is an energy that is external to ourselves because we're not doing this all by ourselves. You know, I do believe we've got a team who's helping, helping us out, right? But their job is to be hands off until such time as either we ask directly and we really don't know the answer, like we really don't think we know the answer, or we're in peril and it's not the direction we're supposed to be going in, all right? So some people will go to oracle cards or tarot cards, or they'll go see a reader, or they'll go talk to a medium, or they'll talk to an intuitive. They'll talk to someone outside themselves. Perfectly acceptable, because bouncing ideas off of other people can help us get clear about what it is that maybe we're not hearing directly or as directly. So that's the second level of intuition, is when we ask for help and we call in physical people or energetic beings who try to get us to see clearly the path that we're supposed to take or the answer to the question that we're asking. But if we still are not listening, paying attention, we're obtuse, we're stubborn, we can't see the forest for the trees, then that's when the third level of intuition kicks in. And, and that's what I call the big guns, which is basically the universe. The universe says, okay, look, We've given you this, this, and this. We tried to indicate here, here, and here. We gave you all these red flags. We we put so many posters in front of you of that new career that you're supposed to take, and you're still not doing it. <laughs> okay, so here's what's going to happen. There's going to be an event in your life that's going to take you out. It's going to be so big that you cannot ignore it, right? It's a life event. It could be an accident could be a car accident, it could be falling down the stairs, it could be the carpet gets pulled out from underneath you and your spouse just gets up and leaves. Like it could be any number of things, could be a cancer diagnosis, but it's going to be something that you're going to have to stop, put on the brakes, take a deep breath and say, okay, I surrender. I surrender what needs to happen now. And that's the third level of intuition. Yeah. And, and that's the level I try to avoid. I try to listen at the first and second level. <laughs> well, 
well, this is the whole point of it, right? If you if you do listen to yourself in the beginning and you make confident, wise choices for yourself, then you don't need to have the big event. You know, it doesn't doesn't have to happen for you. Uh, but you know what? We a we're human. We get distracted. We think we know better. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't. We also get enmeshed. We get enmeshed with other people, with ideas, with beliefs, and it isn't always easy to unmesh ourselves or demesh ourselves. And so then these wake up calls come in. And I think most people have had them. I've, I haven't met anybody who hasn't had some kind of a wake up call in their life where they can go back to that and say, that's what changed everything. I was going this way. I had my blinders on and then wham and 180. That's yep. the wake up call. Yes. I've had a wake up call and I'm like, all right, got it guys. <laughs> and stick to level one and two. Don't want to do this again. But yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, Megan. This has been a fantastic conversation. I always end out every episode by asking my guests if they've shifted in perspective on anything recently since the show is called Shifting Dimensions. And it could be mm. as lighthearted as you want it to be or as deep as you want it to be. Mm. I Yeah, I was thinking about that. So much has changed in the last five years uh, for everybody. So much has changed. More than has a perspective of mine changed, what I feel has happened over the last few years is that my perspective has solidified into what I what really is my my message to the world. It's it's what we were just talking about to some degree. It's this idea that we are far wiser then we realize myself included lots of things that I don't know <laughs> you know I I'd like to say I know some things about some things but there's some things I don't know anything about and that's okay like it's okay to not have all the answers it's okay to enjoy being human it's okay to be wrong it's okay to be right it's okay to take a chance and try something new on and try something different. It's okay to tell somebody something you haven't told them before. And now's the time to say it. It's really about permission. It's about giving ourselves permission to be okay with who we are and to recognize that we have the ability and the capacity to look after ourselves. And if we feel like we don't, then we have the capacity to ask somebody else to help us. Ultimately, we're too hard on ourselves and we take ourselves way too seriously. And honestly, the universe is probably laughing more than we realize. <laughs> <laughs> that was how beautiful. damn serious we take ourselves. Yeah, I know. I, I And I get that sense a lot. I, I feel like the universe is, actually has a great sense of humor a lot of times. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for sharing that. I resonate with that so much and 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 that's kind of like what I've been thinking about over the last couple of days so I think you are speaking directly to me and the listeners who are listening to this show right now thank you Megan where can people find you if they want to learn more about you or purchase your book oh thank you so they can go to my website which is meganedge.ca um, on the website there's all sorts of information about what I do and how I do it uh, there's a place to purchase the book the book we're kind of talking about the book the book is called the heart's journey Healing Hearts, Oracle Cards, and Guidebook. It's actually a box set. And in the set, there is the guidebook, which explains my story about these hearts and why they came to me. And each heart has its own story. And then there's this beautiful journal. It's all my own photography. I took photographs of all these hearts when I started to find them. And, and it eventually evolved into this. And then you get a little bookmark. You get a pen. And you get your deck of Healing Hearts, Oracle Cards. 42 full color book, um, full, full color cards, a labor of love. <laughs> beautiful. Um, and, and a beautiful tool, a beautiful tool to help with that healing journey. Because where it, where does it all begin? It begins in the heart. Absolutely. Um, people can also find me on LinkedIn under Megan Edge. Um, I also have a, another website, which is called Beyond the Garden Gate Botanicals, beyondthegardengate.ca. And that's where I, I teach people about nature and working with nature uh, working with the medicine of nature, how to forage, how to feel comfortable in nature, all of that wonderful stuff. Uh, and then I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram under Megan Edge Healing and Beyond the Garden Gate Botanicals. Awesome. So lots gonna... of places to find me. 
lots of wonderful places. I'm going to link all of that in the show notes. Thank you again, Megan, for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. It's It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for having me on. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. Thank you, Junie.